I sang that song for more than 60 years, a song of praise to Joseph Smith, the prophet of the restoration and founder of the LDS Church, the church I served as a bishop for five years. I knew the church was true. I was a faithful Latter-day Saint. My life has been built on certain truths, but wishing doesn't change the truth. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. When I finally learned the truth about the real history and doctrines of Mormonism, I realized that I was following the gospel of Joseph Smith and not the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have come to learn that many others have made a similar journey out of the bondage of religion and into an authentic relationship with Jesus. And that's what this show is all about. Courageous people who want to share their story, hoping that you, the viewer, will discover the same new life in Jesus. So if you're a Latter-day Saint who is struggling with questions or seeking a genuine encounter with the Savior, we invite you to join us tonight. We have a joyful message that we want to share with you. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Ex-Mormon Files. I'm your host, Bishop Earl. And we have actually a real treat here today. Uh, we, uh, as we got into the interview with Josh Nielsen last, uh, we could tell that there was much more to say and much more to hear. And so I'm pleased to welcome Josh back. <laughs> Thank you. For a second interview. I should have changed my shirt. Uh, yeah. I <laughs> had something else we could throw on there or something. But anyway, it's just so fascinating. But if, for just a minute or two, why don't we recap? Just uh, you're born here in Utah and raised culturally, at least as a Mormon. Yeah, born and raised culturally as a Mormon, came to faith real seriously in the LDS Church at the age of 20, um, was absolutely trying to be super Mormon during that entire time, probably till I was probably till I was about 20, 23 years old. You when, get through the temple at about age 21 mm -hmm. and, and just really active and... Uh, yep. And during this time, did you, you, did you sense that you were living the law? I mean, I knew you, you said you were following the rules, but did you have a sense now, now looking back that uh, we know now that we're living a law, we're trying to please God through our works, yeah. which we, we know is impossible because we're sinners and so on. Did you, but did you sense that at that time? Oh, yeah. You were so, oh, you did? Oh, yeah. No, now, I, see, I, I, didn't, I didn't sense that I was... I mean, I knew I was living rules, but I didn't know that it was in lieu of that my works were uh, replacing the grace that, that Christ had offered me. I was, so I, I didn't have a concept of grace. I Okay, was, so you were just doing the, yeah, doing I, the works, getting it done. I think, you know. You, I didn't either. I think you have stages of, you have stages of faith in, yeah. the more, in the LDS Church. I think the first is where it's brand new, or you've lived it and you're living it to the T. Yeah. You're so into the doctrine, you're so into the works, you're so into the community that you just feel good about yourself. Yeah. But there comes a point when there's a strain and a tension that I think everybody's going to feel. So if you would have talked to me about grace in my 20s, I would have laughed at you and been the best church apologist on the planet. Okay. When you talked to me about it when I was going through my, my dissociation with the church while I was coming to terms with not living the law fully, I would have gotten mad at you right. and pretended I was doing it. Yeah. You know, It wasn't until I left that I could finally... Now, you mentioned the experience in the temple when you were looking at other people who you knew had committed sins or at least weren't up to par, maybe necessarily. Uh, that's a judgment that we just kind of innate to Mormonism, do you think? Or oh, it, it absolutely probably is. Probably in many cultures. But, I oh, mean, it's in Christianity. Yeah, but, but we judge definitely that these people aren't worthy uh, to be where they're doing, what they're doing. We're judging them constantly. So we were talking before this, I, I finally attended my first LDS service since I left the church in probably when, 10 years. When, when did you go? About a year and a half ago. Oh, okay. It was for a baby blessing. Yeah. And uh, I, it's not that I had avoided it, it just never just had the opportunity. Had to, go, to go back. So I, I walked in and, and I dressed a little bit less reverently than I normally would have when I was going. And yeah. I could tell immediately that when you walk into an established ward, Yeah. Everybody knows everybody. So when somebody new comes in the room, there's automatically a judgment filter. And I remember sitting there and people were watching us and I could feel the judgment. And if you weren't white shirt and tie. <laughs> weren't white shirt and tie. And I think they knew that this is, you know, my, the, the family that's not LDS anymore. There's probably some of that narrative going on. And uh, especially when the, the, when the sacrament was, was passed and I didn't take it. 
Mm. I was there with my wife. I was there with my kids, with members of our Bible study that I was teaching at the time. Wow. And I told them, it's your preference whether you take it or not. Yeah. I don't care. I'm not going to get dogmatic about it. But I personally chose not to take it because I was not going to, this is going to sound so weird, I was not going to take something blessed to an idol. Mm. That's, it's, I mean, but that was that was my thoughts at the time, but but there was a judgment happening there. And, and they called all the men that had the Melchizedek priesthood up to sing hail to the man. Oh, and did. I immediately felt like, wow. Praise to the man. I'm not worthy to go up there and sing with these guys that hold the priesthood. Then they started singing praise to the man, and I about crawled out of my skin. <laughs> and my mom afterwards looked at me. She said, how'd you do it? I said, by the grace of God. I don't know how I got through it. Oh. <laughs> it was it was it was a yeah it was a rough experience. Well, we kind of got through your to your story about uh, your participating in church a little less often. Yeah, you you were starting to feel even going golfing with your dad and mm -hmm. so on. Um, so so pick it up from there and you go through. This is two thousand. This is or probably so? two thousand three. Throughout two thousand three. Two thousand three. Okay. Yeah. So I was oh, two thousand four. Yeah, two thousand four. So I I finally got to a point where I was ready to break with the church. I'd had all now, of those Now, was this over doctrine or just? Probably more over community. Community. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, the doctrine. So the, the, the straw that broke the camel's back was the South Park Mormon episode. So, oh, really? Yeah, that's when it all came together. Uh, my wife and I now, were watching South Park. Was this the South one Park. with Joseph Smith yes. and reading? I yeah. I have seen clips of that, I think. I don't... It's irreverent. It's funny. It's actually very factual. And what do you mean? That what You were watching it and it all of a sudden hit you? That... It all of a sudden hit me, the worldview perception of Mormonism. Mm. And, you know, the creators of South Park are, are former LDS, former missionaries. Well, they're the ones that wrote... Uh, the Book of Mormon, the, the musical. Mormon, the yeah. musical. Okay. Yeah, so, you know, they, they show the scene of Joseph talking into the hat and, you know, some lady in the background going, he's talking into a hat. You know, where's the... <laughs> and when I realized just the lens that the rest of the world saw Mormonism through, and then I put my narrative together, it was at that point that I realized the doctrine wasn't as real, and I actually became quite disenchanted with religion in general. I was wow. mad. I, I became, I didn't, I didn't become atheist, but I became severely agnostic. Now, were you doing more study at this point, or did you just kind of back off completely? I backed off completely. Um, I literally just, I, I had to break with it. Okay. And that was the hardest part, because it, leaving the church, this is, this is, so this is my own personal theory, and sometimes I go around the block to go next door, so I apologize for doing this, but I look at my parents who left the LDS church in the 70s and late 60s. And they left it being told by their parents, their grandparents, their teachers, their community leaders, everybody that the church was the one true church. This was how sure. Utah lived, sure. you know, probably till the 90s. In order for them to leave the, that faith, they literally had to choose hell. Yeah. They didn't know any different. My parents literally said, I'm going to cast my dice here on earth than be a part of this church. Hmm. For me, leaving it had nothing to do with my salvation. My leaving was embarrassment. I wasn't, I, was, I wasn't even worried about whether I was going to heaven or hell. I was worried about what my family and friends and neighbors thought That's about me washing about. out. Yeah. Well, you've brought up a, a point that I think is really sensitive, and we generally don't cover a lot of this in, in hearing people's stories, but a lot of Mormons coming out of the church end up agnostic or, or atheist. atheist. Yeah. Because... And my theory is, is that they have not developed a relationship with God, with Jesus, and with the Bible. Then they find out that Joseph Smith isn't who he said he was. The Book of Mormon, as we said, doesn't have any support. Right. And that there's all these other problems, the blacks and the, <laughs> the, Book, the of Book of Abraham and, Abraham and, and yeah. the temple, Mason, masonry in the temple and so on. Yeah. So they don't have a relationship with God. It's not like a Methodist leaving for Presbyterianism because right. he has a relationship with God. He doesn't care where he goes to church. Right. Um, he knows who Jesus is and what he did for him. But yeah. what's your theory about this? Why, why do Mormons go agnostic and atheist? I think there's two parts to it. I think the first is that you have been told by your community what is true. So in, in, in effect, you have to come to the realization that you're Family and community leaders either lied to you, or they don't understand. Oh, they they're lying didn't to know you. either. They didn't know and either. They're just following what they've been told. Right. And and the longer you've been indoctrinated in it, you can talk about it to pull yourself out of a lifetime of following a theology. You have to admit that that was wrong, and that you've been wrong, and you've yeah. been duped all this time. You've been duped, and, and so, you don't want to be duped again. And you and that's the thing is, and and, and you're taught, you know, I, I one of my 
former employees who I had a really good relationship with came up to me years, just a few years ago when I started pastoring and said, so you're a pastor now? And I said, yeah. She goes, what church are you, are you attending? And I said, well, the whore of the earth. And she jumped in. <laughs> and I have the relationship. I Babylon. can say that to her. Yeah. <laughs> and she said, well, and I said, you know, you believe that. And I think it's because you're taught that all other religions are bad too. And well, so like why you put your skin in the church. game? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So why put your skin in the game? So it's a combination of being lied to by a community and not wanting to go through that experience again and probably just being free. There is, I think there's some element of truth to mm -hmm. that where yeah. all of a sudden you just, you're not shackled anymore with the, the burden. But you don't have a trust in the Bible. Not at all. Right? I mean, yeah. Our eighth article of faith is. Yeah, as it's translated correctly. Yeah, so you have yeah. no trust there. You have no background in the, in the Bible. You don't understand no. anything about Greek or Hebrew or, you know, so anybody that brings up an error or a problem with the, with the King James or anything mm -hmm. else, you just assume that adds to the fact that, well, we can't trust it. Can't it, trust it, it so ruined. I'm going to lean on the Book of Mormon and doctrine and what my neighbors yeah. are telling me. Then you me. find yeah. out that Book of Mormon isn't true, so you have nothing to, you right. have no anchor. Right, and then, you know, it, it's, and it's hard, you can't just open the Bible and just understand it. No, I mean, it takes some study. It and, takes time, and, but I mean, there are some very easy translations, but I think ultimately my break was I was just really hurt by the experience and when I did realize that the doctrine wasn't supported by anything that made sense. Other than a man. Other than a man. Yeah. Uh, it was easy for me to break and so, and I tell this story openly, uh, my wife and I were on vacation with my in-laws, we were in Arizona and I love my in-laws but it just happened to be a really stressful vacation and our plane got delayed and so the airline offered us a free night stay and a dinner and two free drinks and so that night we were supposed to be in town going to church the next day and I went out to dinner and I just got drunk. I got smashed and said, I'm done. And that was literally my official break. break. I'm done with it. Took oh. the garments off and said, I'm, I'm out. Wow. Yeah. And this was, again, 2003, or is this later? About 2004. 2004, yeah. So now you go through this period of time. What were you doing during this period of time? Not much. You know, I, I, I had two beautiful girls, uh, went and got my master's degree, built yeah. my career up. So I was busy. Yeah. I was busy, and, and in the meantime, I reconnected with um, my secular friends and made a whole new group of secular friends who I'm really close to today. And we just had a community of secular friends. None of us were, were religious. Um, oh, we they weren't even Christian. Weren't even Christian. No, we just we would go out as couples and hang out. We would go to bars, go to concerts, and just have a blast. We were all good people. Mm. Had a humanistic view. I hope there's a heaven. You know that yeah. type of thing. But we were really busy. You know, going camping, raising and, family, and mm -hmm. then we all had kids about the same time. And now mm. we all still get together and just let our kids tear each other's houses apart. And How many kids do you have? I have two, two, two. girls. Yeah. And so you just kind of go through this period of time, and mm -hmm. then what happens? So about two, I'm an avid reader. <clears throat> so 2006, I graduate with my undergrad, and I have a lot of free time on my hands. So I stumble across the Left Behind series, which I know and is... who does that? Uh, Tim LaHaye and Jerry B. Jenkins. Okay. And I know it's not a theologically sound book. So a lot of, a lot of mature Christians will tell you, don't get your theology from Left Behind. But, it, you know, to me it was an entertaining fiction. And I didn't know any different. But it's about a seven-book series. You were just curious? I mean, you just had some yeah. time on your hands? Yeah. And yeah, I think it was a combination of, it was a good read. No sense of, gee, I need to go back to Mormonism? No, or any other, or find God in any or capacity. Or any religion. Right. Okay. So, as, no, I had broken from Mormonism, and I was not looking back. Okay. They were in the rearview mirror. And, uh, and so I read through the seventh book, and at the end of the seventh book, it's, it's, it's the story of Revelation. It's people who were left behind and, and lived right. the, the seven years They've of tribulation. They've done a movie, haven't they? Uh, they tried to, yeah. Uh, they did a couple segments of it. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's... But uh, at the end of it, the, the authors invite you to say the sinner's prayer. And so I... Had you ever heard <clears throat> of that before? No. Or at least never done it before. Never so. done it before. So I was in my car listening to an audio book, and I said the sinner's prayer. And I did get a little bit choked up at the concept of Jesus being real. And I did it, and, and literally from 2006 until July or June of 2012, I still maintained my secular lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Even yeah. though you had that experience. Yeah, even though I had that the experience. The sinner's prayer and, yeah. and all. God, God needed me to mature a lot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, about 2012, so my life is put together. I've got an amazing wife, an amazing group of friends. I've got my kids. I've got... Uh, my kids are out of diapers. Um, I've got my college degrees behind me. I've yeah. got a career. I've got one of the nicest lawns in the neighborhood. I'm just I'm living the, the yeah. white picket fence dream life. Season tickets to the Utah games. Life is good, right? Yeah. And uh, I get hit with anxiety. 
At 2012? About 2000. Well, early, sooner than that, but it really debilitated me in 2012. But apparently, it's a hereditary in my family. Mm -hmm. So I got to the point. So I have everything put together in my life. I mean, I'm out of debt. We're saving money. You know, life is good, but I'm missing the spiritual element. And so I finally, you know, was in my basement one night watching the furnace turn on and off, waiting for it to go out. That's how bad the anxiety was. And that's not me. Anyone who tells you that's not me, that knows me, that's not me. So I... Uh, I literally prayed and said, Jesus, if you're real, fix me. Wow. And a series of events happened over the summer of 2012 that just solidified my faith. In Jesus. Yeah. Yep. Wow. Absolutely. And would you call these your born again experiences? Or would, yeah. would that even be more back to the sinner's prayer time? Uh, no, I, these were my born again experiences. So I started off, um, I, I told my wife, poor lady, I said, let's go to, we're going to start going to church. We're going to check out these evangelicals. Mm. Now, her mom had been born again since 96 and had been trying to get us to go to church for years. And, and I think we attended one or two services at her church, which is a wonderful group of people. And I was really freaked out by it because I still had my LDS um, lens on sure. with Christianity, but I still also had a secular lens. Yeah. Now, I didn't want to go be in a room with a bunch of people doing this, you know, singing songs. So uh, I told my wife, let's go check out some churches. We ultimately landed at Calvary Chapel. Here, um, here in Salt Lake. Here in Salt Lake, Terry Long and his staff, you know, Keith and Jim uh, and, and John at the time. Just amazing. It's a great church. It is. And yeah. uh, I, so I started reading the Bible. My brother and I, um, who's eight years younger than me, had had a fight, and I hadn't talked to him for about a year. And I'm reading the book of Matthew, and I keep reading this, forgive your brother, forgive your brother forgive your brother. It's actually repeated. That's hitting you quite, hard. It's hitting me really yeah. hard. So finally I just said, all right, God, what do you want me to do? Got in my car, drove over to my mom's house, um, walked through the door, talked to my brother for the first time. I said, look, I found Jesus. He's real. I'm reading the Bible. God told me to forgive you. And ultimately, break down tears. We hug. Oh. I mean, it was a reconciliation. And I'm thinking, That's oh my awesome. gosh. And, and a few months later, he was baptized. Really? Yeah. So I started going to church and then my mom starts going, and my stepdad starts going, and my brother, and then my wife, and then oh her aunt, her, her uncle, and her grandma start attending church. I mean, like this, this just catalyst, this snowball starts, starts going down. So then um, I'm sitting in my front lawn shortly after that experience. This is the dumbest story ever, but this was my real faith moment. This is the first time I had a prayer answered. I'm in my front yard. I'm fixing a sprinkler. I'm bent down. I stand up, and a kid hits me right in the chest with a bike. Kid's going full speed on a mountain bike. Just comes right at you. Knocks me back 10 feet. Wow. I stand up, make sure he's okay, we're okay. an accident, of course. Oh, accident, I mean, total accident. Purpose. Yeah, the yeah. skid marks are still on my fence <laughs> from when it happened. And, uh, and I stand up and I go to walk and I can't walk. And I look down and my toenail on my big toe is half hanging off. And if you want to talk about like two things that I can't deal with, it's toenails, or fingernails, toenails, and teeth. <laughs> just don't, just, you know, knock yeah. me out. Yeah. Put so my neighbor gives me a muscle relaxer and knocks me out for the night, and I come limping into work on Monday. And one of my employees comes up to me and says, um, what, uh, what are you limping for? And, it, you know, she's LDS. Oh. She's awesome. I love her. And she, she, I said, well, I got my tonal ripped off. She goes, what are you going to do about it? And I said, I'm going to go to Instacare. She says, they're going to butcher you. So I sit down at my desk, and I kind of pray a little bit. And I say, God, what do you, God, help me here. I'm terrified. Like, I'm so terrified of my toe. This is how stupid this sounds. She comes up and says, we're insured. Go to a podiatrist. So I'm like, oh. So I look on our insurance, find a podiatrist within walking distance of my house. And I call them and they go, oh, we're booked up for the next two weeks. Oh, wait, we have an appointment at 11. Oh, my. Well, it gets better. I had just been promoted. So I had a meeting with my new boss. Called him up and said, my toenails ripped off. He says, go. So I'm driving to the doctor and I just get this overwhelming sense of peace. And I pull up and as the doctor is injecting my toe with numbing needles, I'm sitting on the bed just literally almost crying that my prayer had been answered. It was from that point forward I went, okay, there's a God. And he's watching out. Yeah. And you probably can see that throughout your whole life now of, of what you've yeah. experienced. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Wow. And so yeah. now you, you've you ended up becoming, a, as you say, a pastor yeah. um, at a church, Hope Unlimited. Yeah, Hope Unlimited Community Tell Church. Tell us about that. Um, <clears throat> I was feeling pretty good about myself one Saturday morning in September 20, or no, July 2015. I, I love watching golf. I'm a huge golf fan. I was watching the British Open. Okay. We're watching it on one TV, 
and playing it on Tiger Woods Golf on another TV. Oh my. my feet are kicked up, the air conditioning's on, I'm, I'm in heaven. Toes healed. Toes healed <laughs> over a year, you know, or no, no, toe hadn't been ripped, yeah, no, the toe was definitely healed at that point. Oh, okay. Yeah, toe was healed for about Sorry. three years. No, that's, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I was feeling pretty good about myself. I was attending church periodically, I was giving a little bit here and there, I was teaching a Bible study at my house on Wednesdays, and I was volunteering at the prison, teaching Bible studies there, and I was just feeling real good about myself. And I get this little sentence in my head that says, what have you done for the Lord lately? Who? <laughs> and it, it was literally, I jumped out of my seat. And I stopped playing and I stopped watching. And uh, I immediately, because Calvary is a great church, but God needed me in my community. So the next morning I got up, um, got on my motorcycle about 9 a.m., started riding around Kearns, Taylorsville, looking for a church in my neighborhood. And I stumbled upon Hope Unlimited, and I walked in the door, and I introduced myself to the pastor, and uh, he and I had lunch, and slowly over a progression, um, Tony Roberts, who is our lead pastor, and Margot Roberts, his wife, uh, have become two of my best friends and partners in ministry, and we've just literally been trying to grow a church in Kearns. Wow. Yeah, it's been a phenomenal experience. Oh, well, that's neat. And uh, and you teach sometimes, I hear? Yeah, about every other month. So I, 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 did, I actually taught last Sunday. Mm -hmm. um, they're, you know, in their in their lack of wisdom, they let me get up and speak. I can be irreverent at times, but you know, I try and do it, you know, in the summertime in shorts and flip flops, yeah. just to get people comfortable. When they walk in the church, they realize that that you know we really are coming to work. It's not about how you dress. No. And, yeah. No. So we we teach we just preach the gospel of Jesus unashamedly, and we are trying to be avid servers in our community. Now, have you had some former Mormons come, and have you talked to them and yeah. tried to share? What what are their concerns? What do they what do they ask for? What do they? Or, what they don't ask for much. Yeah. They come in quiet. Yeah. They come in searching. We had one couple who were engaged. They came in. One was Christian. One was Mormon. And they were trying to decide before they get married which church they're going to go to. She said, "All right, one week you go to my church. One week I'll go to yours, and we'll decide who okay. we want, which church you want to go to." First week he showed up at our church. He says, "I'm not going back." To the Mormon. Yeah. He immediately, and so what we do is we have a progression of connection classes where we have a dinner with our pastor, and he's, he shares the vision of Hope Unlimited, which is really compelling. We give you a good dinner, and, 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 uh, and he shares the vision. Then we go through a four-week class where we just teach the basics. Who is God? Of Christianity. Yeah, basic, yeah, basics of Christianity. Who is God? What is the Bible? What is the church? And what's next? Wow. 101, Christian 101. But, the, in, but a Mormon coming out needs that because like, they don't yeah. understand it's life support right it literally is life support because in, when i was coming out i basically said i can see that the mormon church and the joseph smith stuff and all the first visions and book sure. of abraham all this stuff that there's something wrong here so christianity what do you have for me yeah what do you what, have in... what do what do i what have i been missing right and i didn't know so much i mean i still don't yeah, but, <laughs> But this is wonderful. So you go through that, and people then learn about God. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then and the once Bible. they're once they're properly on their way to being discipled, yeah, because that's not discipling. That's just that's no, that's, that's milk. Just, yeah. basically is what it is. Yeah. Then we offer them baptism. So we baptized twenty three people this year. Of the twenty three people we baptized, and I'm just I'm approximating. I want to say sixty percent were former LDS. Well, that's what we hear, at least we hope we're hearing, or yeah. we think we're hearing that there's so many coming out. I mean, there yeah. is and there isn't. I mean, we're getting the fringe LDS. You know, we're getting the ones who were kind of like me that were, that were never quite heavily yeah. involved, but culturally LDS and not knowing that there's another, right. that God is out there. Right. And so from, from our perspective, we're taking the Mars Hill approach, um, the, the unknown God approach that Paul speaks about in, in the book of Acts, and we're not attacking Right. We we will you will never hear Trying to share the good news. Yeah, you will yeah. never hear anti LDS from our pulpit. You you will only hear about God. And then once they feel comfortable, I will sit down and we will sit down and have dialogues with them about okay. that doctrine. Oh good. But yeah. So the name of the church is Hope Unlimited. Hope Community. Unlimited Community Church in Kearns, Utah. Yeah. Okay. An address? Uh yeah, forty one fifteen West Sam's Boulevard, Kearns, Utah. We have a really bad inter uh, uh, website that I'm working on. It's <laughs> hopeunlimitedslc.org. Okay. You can at least get some information on there. But yeah, we're we're growing. We're small, but you know we we've seen some growth and we're seeing some discipleship and we're just trying to be authentic. Now, in your family, you've had to share the message, I guess, with a brother. And uh, mm -hmm. did you have any other ones that you've shared with? And has it been 
good experience or Phen well, would you uh, do anything differently? So the LDS portion of my family, um, they've been amazing. They've never judged me at one point. Not, not once. Really? It was interesting. Even back when you didn't go on your mission and that kind of thing? Oh, yeah. No, no, really? no. They were cool. Even So from, from day one, from when I actually came out and said, I'm out, I'm done, We would talk. they would talk about church pretty openly at family gatherings. You know, oh, we went to the temple this week. So, oh, good. Good for you. Yeah. I'm not going. Thank yeah. you, though. It, but it, it was a civil conversation. But ever since I've gone to the pastoral level, and, and my stepdad is actually our business admin, so like our whole family is starting to get oh, And my brother's running the soundboard. So, I mean, now oh, we have this neat. huge evangelical presence at the family functions. It is a white elephant in the room. They won't talk about it. Why, just, why is that? Are they afraid to learn? <laughs> I th yeah, I think I think they're afraid that, that you know more than they do. Or is that either that or they, they might be swayed or or they're just afraid the relationship might be strained. I don't know. And some of them, I think some of them are so comfortable in the social and the mm -hmm. cultural part of it yeah. that to hear anything else, even from someone that they might respect and love, mm -hmm. uh, puts a, a je jeopardizes maybe their their faith or their it does comfortable life. It does. It lifestyle. does. And I mean, and, and they have to admit that they were wrong to some extent. I think every LDS person has, has a moment of dissonance, a moment where they question. And I've seen it in people that I've talked to really? recently. And I, I don't want to get into specifics because I don't yeah. want to. But, yeah. but uh, there comes a point where it took me going from super Mormon to dissonant Mormon before I could finally start asking the questions. When you're so engrossed in the church and the works and you feel so good about yourself and you've reached a position that you know you've reached because of what you've done, it's really hard to talk to that person. But every person in the LDS faith is going to come to that point where they're going to say, maybe it's not what I think it is. Yeah. And when they get to that point, they really need to reach out and talk to somebody. And they're not going to get that support in the church. No. My wife used to keep coming to me and say, well, do you think we're really going to make it? And I'd say, honey, oh. we, we've done everything we need to. We're keeping the law. We're, we're going to be married in the celestial kingdom. We're that gonna, kills me. We're like, be I, there. My, uh, my two grandmothers, almost, one, almost 91, 91, are terrified to die. Because they don't know what... They don't know if, if they're going to make happen. it. Yeah. Have they done enough? Have they? And, and, you know, I had another family member say, I just hope one day God pats me on the head and says, you did enough. And I said, I hope God never pats me on the head because I'll be blinked out of existence. Yeah. <laughs> well, and like we've always said, well, we've said so often here, we're, we know we're sinners. Or we, in Mormonism, you really don't know you're sinners, but you, you know you're not perfect. You know you're, you're not, not good enough, yeah, but you're not a yeah. sinner. Well, Josh, believe it or not, our, our time's gone again. Wow. So Having fun. Yeah. So I appreciate you spending this extra time with us and uh, for your testimony and for your sharing. and. And what good news that is. What freedom and liberty that we feel in Christ. There is freedom. And that gift yeah. that he's given us of yep. grace. So thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time. And that was my